It was on a somber day in 1888 when a French newspaper went to print with the headline, The Merchant of Death is Dead, describing a man from Sweden as someone who became rich by finding ways to kill more people faster than ever before. That man was Alfred Noble, who just so happened to be reading that obituary that spoke of his death. He had not died, however, yet all the same was devastated to hear of how he would be remembered. This is the story of how the son of an inventor made a dangerous discovery that cost the lives of many, but also led to the extraordinary progress on projects that might not have been possible otherwise. So get ready for this explosive episode as we learn something new. Alfred Bernhard Noble was born in 1833 in Stockholm, Sweden. His father, Emanuel Noble, was an inventor and engineer who struggled financially for much of his life. After being forced to declare bankruptcy, Emanuel moved his family to St. Petersburg, Russia, where he'd managed to impress the Tsar with one of his inventions, a submerged explosive mine that could stop potential naval invasions. This brought him, his wife, and their eight children, including Alfred, some wealth and prominence within Russia, allowing Alfred to get a formal education, including many classes in chemistry, physics, and natural sciences. Alfred also had a deep interest in poetry, but was forbidden from pursuing it, with his father instead sending him to Paris, where he would continue his training in chemistry and engineering. While there, he met an Italian chemist named Asanio Sobrero, a man who had dedicated his studies toward the invention of nitroglycerin. Sombrero had discovered in 1847 through his research and experimentation that a combination of glycerin with nitric acid and sulfuric acid could bring about an oily, liquid explosive substance that packed incredible power when ignited. But this discovery horrified Sobrero, and he was worried constantly about its destructive nature. This fear only became worse when he was experimenting with the substance, and it exploded within a test tube, sending glass fragments everywhere and scarring his face and hands. After coming to his conclusions again and again and making sure he had the formula just right for the substance, he would still keep silent for over a year as he feared what the liquid might be used for. But in the end, he figured it was best to get ahead of a potential discovery by someone else. So Sombrero would go on to write in journals and letters that the oil was exceptionally dangerous and nearly impossible to handle with any degree of safety, and was quoted as saying, When I think of all the victims killed in nitroglycerin explosions and the terrible havoc that had been wrecked, which in all probability will continue to occur in the future, I am almost ashamed to admit to be its discoverer. But when Alfred Noble, who had been overseeing the construction of several bridges as part of his engineering studies, found found out about nitroglycerin, he was sure that it could have many beneficial uses if only its power could be tamed. At that point, his father, whose prevalence in Russia was dwindling, was seeking new opportunities. So when Alfred brought him the idea of manufacturing nitroglycerin on a large scale, he readily agreed, setting up a factory back in Sweden to produce it. But it wouldn't take long for tragedy to strike. Shortly after beginning operations, an explosion at the factory killed Alfred's youngest brother. The family rebuilt, repaired, and restarted operations, but this time, they were determined to make things safer. Inside the factory, the workers spending long hours monitoring the reactions to create nitroglycerin were forced to sit on stools with only one leg, forcing them to balance and tipping them if they began to fall asleep on the job. Alfred, on the other hand, was hard at work in his laboratory, focusing on adapting the oil into something that could be handled more safely, that is, only exploding when it was intended to. One of these creations that Alfred made resulted in several deadly explosions, including what he called Nobel's Blasting Oil, which blew up in a storeroom in San Francisco in 1866, killing 15 workers. A newspaper would go on to write about the incident, saying that the new explosive was five times more powerful in its effects than gunpowder. Alfred continued with his experiments to create a safer form, but it was dangerous work. His laboratory was eventually moved to a barge on a lake to mitigate damage from any accidental explosions. Since the oil's consistency was what made it prone to spontaneous detonations, he tried mixing it with something that would make it thicker, trying everything from brick to wood into coal dust, letting them absorb the oil before setting it off. 
After many materials were tried, in 1867, he finally settled on diatomaceous earth, essentially a dirt-like substance made from bits of fossilized algae. It was able to absorb the nitroglycerin and in turn form it into a doughy substance, preventing any bubbles from forming that might cause an unwanted explosion. He took this new form and ran with it wrapping the sticks of the substance with heavy paper and at first changing the name to Noble Safety Blasting Powder before later changing it to dynamite, inspired by the ancient Greek word for power. It was exactly what the ever-expanding network of railroads needed. The powerful blast could easily move large amounts of rock and earth in much less time than by using picks. Plus, its new form meant that it was safer to transport over the rugged terrain to the construction sites. It's believed that some of the massive projects of the early 20th century couldn't have been accomplished had they not used dynamite. And a prime example of this was the Hoover Dam. The project was a massive undertaking, which required the diverting of the entire Colorado River's flow around the construction site. To do this, four 56-foot diameter tunnels had to be constructed, stretching for miles. In their construction, every 14 feet of tunnel required one ton of dynamite. In total, more than 8.5 million pounds of dynamite were used in the creation of the dam. This new form of dynamite was one that would stick around. The engineering projects it was used for were helping revolutionize the mega projects governments could take on, as well as the mining operations that were able to scale to help supply the raw materials for the Industrial Revolution, in large part provided by the United States Blasting Oil Company, of which Noble was a part owner, with their 16 factories across 14 countries. But while dynamite was better, it wasn't perfect, as many miners would find out. If left in a place for a long enough time, it could start to sweat, with the more unstable nitroglycerin pooling at the bottom of the box, once again making it just as dangerous as the blasting oil that preceded it. In September of 1904, a trolley car in Boston hit a 50-pound box of dynamite, which had fallen onto the tracks from a passing-by cart, causing a blast radius of 100 feet and killing 10. There were further accidental explosions with even higher death counts in 1913 and 1926. Dynamite was a hugely helpful tool in many industries, but its name was constantly tainted by the unintended damage it caused leading Noble to dedicate the rest of his career to improving it further, eventually replacing the diatomaceous earth with nitrocellulose, which is another explosive substance that made the dynamite's explosion even more powerful, but with a greater stability and longer shelf life. It didn't sweat, and as an added bonus, it could be used underwater. But many governments would soon start to see the explosive tool as a potential weapon. The American military, for example, would make the first dynamite guns, able to launch a dynamite-like explosive projectile up to 5,000 yards with a pneumatic launch system, which was primarily installed for use as coastal defense in San Francisco and New York City. It was because of these military uses, as well as all the deaths that had come before for that, that when Noble's obituary was written in a French newspaper, the headline read, The Merchant of Death is dead. But he wasn't dead. In fact, Noble had read his own obituary, which had been published by mistake. The man who had actually died was his older brother, Ludwig Noble, but the reporter got them mixed up. Alfred had a chance to truly see what the world thought of him, and he was very upset by it. As his own health was beginning to decline, especially from the chest pains, from heart problems he was somewhat ironically prescribed nitroglycerin to treat, he began to look at his own legacy. He wrote his will a year before he died, including that he wanted to form an organization to reward positive efforts, including medicine, chemistry and physics, literature, and peace though economics would later be added. He prepared this will unaided, leaving his vast fortune to a foundation that didn't exist and would only be created after his death. He had hoped Nobel Prizes would encourage people to strive for a positive impact on the world, saying that they should go to those who during the preceding year shall have conferred the greatest benefit on mankind. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like. And as always, Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.